Good morning. I welcome you that are with us and those of you at home. I pray that uh, our time together would be uh, blessed by God as we, we worship, we praise him, as we celebrate all that is ours in Christ Jesus. It's so good to be in the Lord's house with you today. All being a little bit chilly out there today, and uh, I think they're calling for more of that for a while, but uh, I'll take it over the snow, which I think we're getting a little bit tomorrow night, they're saying. So anyway, good to be with you. And uh, well, it seems like these, these Sundays just kind of run in one after the other. It just seems like I just finish one and then it's time to start on another and it just, it's a progression that goes and goes. But I'm thrilled to be with you here today and as we uh, come together today, a few uh, announcements that I wanted to make and share with you. We uh, do have a Bible study that we do via Zoom on Wednesday evenings at 7 p.m. We are currently in the book of Revelation. We'll be in chapter 2 this uh, Wednesday uh, we have altar flowers today presented to the glory of God in memory of Robert Guerin by Bonnie and Dennis Redkay and family. Uh, we have the rosebud on the communion table uh, presented to the glory of God in honor of Robin Lash's birthday on the 22nd. Love, Jim. Happy birthday, Robin. And uh, the bulletin is presented to the glory of God in honor of Robin Lash's birthday on the 22nd by her Zion family. And I also saw other family members that posted celebrations on Facebook for you. So uh, a lot of people celebrating your birthday this year, and that's not a bad thing. Uh, our prayers and sympathies are extended to the family of Esther Leininger, who went home to be with the Lord on January 12th. Uh, I know the services uh, due to COVID were private. They are planning on a, uh, a public uh, worship service at some point, uh, and uh, more information will follow. Uh, we do need... Uh, uh, bulletin and altar flower sponsors in the coming weeks. You can see the, uh, the board as you enter the church. And there's information in your bulletin about Super Bowl Sunday, February 7th. Uh, the uh, Mifflin Community Food Pantry needs uh, various items that are listed in the, uh, on the bulletin that you can see. And typically for canned goods, and they ask that you put a, a dollar bill a rubber banded around uh, one of the donations to help support them as well. And I know they greatly appreciate that. And so, uh, as we uh, begin today, uh, for the words of assurance and the call to worship, I will read the light print, and you can respond with the bold print. When we repent, our God relents, lifting us beyond the pain, restoring us to safety, protecting us in the refuge of eternal love. In the name of Jesus, who is the Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. The God of all creation calls us. Power and steadfast love belong to God. Let us pray. Father God, we come together this morning. We ask that you would pour out your Holy Spirit upon us, that we would indeed have an extra measure of your presence. We pray that you would help us from any distractions that would keep us focusing on you and your spirit during this time of worship. May all that we say and do be pleasing in your sight, for we ask this all in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Our opening hymn today is uh, from the Songs of Zion in Christ Alone. Please stand and join me. Of God in helpless 
Amen. You may be seated. You know, sometimes when God speaks, we need to listen and we need to obey. Uh, Rosalie called me uh, the other day and she said, you know, I've had this tune in my head. And then when I was doing the bulletins and I realized that it was on the back of the bulletin, I knew that God was telling me I needed to do this. And so the special music today is a wonderful grace of Jesus. And there are words on the back of the bulletin if you'd like to sing along. But Rosalie, thank you for your willingness to, uh, to share this with us this morning.
Okay. Wonderful. Very good, Rosalie. Thank you. God is good. I wish I could play piano like that. I'll tell you. Anyway, uh, as always, I am very appreciative, as the governing board is, as the leaders of the church, for all that you do uh, that have made a difference during these uh, last 10 months, a difficult time uh, for the world. Certainly a difficult time for our nation and our, our congregation, and yet God has been faithful. And so I, I thank you through your, your efforts, through your prayers, your time, your talent, and your treasure that we are continuing to reach men and women, boys and girls, with the love and grace of Jesus Christ. Let me pray with you. Father God, we thank you that you are a good and gracious God, that you truly meet all of our needs wonderfully in Christ Jesus. Father, I Pray that you would bless the gift and the giver as we continue to lift up the name of Jesus to a world that's lost in sin, to a people in desperate need of a Savior. It's in our Savior's precious name that we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. You know, we uh, have uh, many people that are connected to our church family and some within our church family that have uh, come down with COVID. And uh, I'm, I'm pleased to say that uh, all of them are on the men. And so praise God for his healing touch upon their lives. And, uh, you know, just so many others that we, we see that are, are facing uh, the challenges of COVID. I know... Um, that uh, Pauline Schmel was in for a procedure the other day for some issues and had to wait many hours to be seen, and that is uh, due to some of the overflowing in our hospitals right now if they're dealing with all the, the people with COVID and other things on top of that that we want to continue to pray about. We want to continue to keep Mark Paul in prayer. Nancy Geis, I was able to talk with her this past week, and and, you know, as I coined the, the phrase last week that somebody else has come up with the description of uh, pandemic fatigue, 
and I could really see it in Nancy, you know, after 10 months of not being able to worship with her church family, being in, not being able to drive and go out and do the things that many of us take for granted, uh, has been a, a major toll. And so we, uh, I know Nancy is having some uh, shoulder issues as well, and we need to keep her in prayer. Uh, I know that um, Pauline is going to be going in for a procedure this week. And so we want to keep Pauline in prayer. Uh, Andy Potts as well, as he's recovering from a slight accident at work, and uh, many others on our prayer list. I know Larry uh, Wolfgang continually keeps me updated on all that's going on in his and Linda's life, and he tells me the same thing over and over. He says, tell the congregation I miss them, I love them, and I can't wait until we can be back together again. And and it's really, this is a real toll that it's taking in many ways, and so I'm grateful for those that partner with us in just praying, you know, praying, and, and even beyond the page, those that God has placed on our hearts and on our lives. I've got friends in Ohio and western Pennsylvania and beyond that, you know, I pray for on a regular basis, and they're, they're going through the challenge we face. They're losing loved ones and mourning loved ones just as we have, and so we, we, we thank God that he does meet all of our needs in Christ Jesus, that no matter what we're facing, And we have the assurance that God is indeed with us every step of the way. Let us pray. Father God, we come together today and we pray that your hand of healing and blessing and provision and protection would be upon every one of us. And you know our needs before we even ask, for you're our creator and sustainer. You know us better than we know ourselves. And so we submit our lives into your care that you would bring healing and provision as only you can. I pray, Father, for those that are having procedures and those that are recovering from procedures and those that are facing just physical and spiritual and financial challenges that you would be with them. We pray for the world as it continues to struggle through this uh, COVID pandemic. We do pray, Father, that healing would take place, that people would begin to be able to resume some of the, the activities that we once took for granted. And so, Father, we thank you that you do bring healing in many ways, in your way and in your time, and for that, we're truly grateful. We pray, Father, for those in our our nursing centers and our shut-ins that aren't able to be here, that you would be with them, Father, that you would just give them the assurance that they are loved, that they are, are valued and they're prayed for. Help us to reach out to those in need as we're able. We pray for our military men and women throughout the world that you would be with them and protect and provide them, Father, as only you can. We pray, Father, that you would uh, be with our our government leaders, uh, our local and national leaders, with our president, that you would bless them, that you would uh, guide them with wisdom, Father, that they would uh, filter what they do through your holy word. And so, Father, be with us as a nation as we strive to find healing. We pray, Father, that you would continue to mold in us and uh, shape in us that which is pleasing to you. And so, Father, we we thank you as we pray, as Jesus taught the disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Wonderful. It's good to know that uh, when we pray that God not only hears our prayers, but he responds and he answers in his perfect way, his perfect time. And sometimes it's really hard, though, to, to, to wait. You know, I, I think that you know, 10 months into this, it's been a long time. And you know, maybe it's this summer, maybe it's this fall, maybe it's beyond. But God will, will bring about healing in his time, in his way. We just need to continue to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. We need to keep clinging to God during this time. We need to keep praying. We need to keep reading the word of God. We need to keep putting that into our lives to help us stay focused and, and, and understand that no matter what, uh, our God's with us every step of the way. For that, I'm grateful, and I certainly appreciate your prayers as well. Uh, our praise hymn today is, is another favorite of mine. It's Amazing Grace. Oh. 
lost, but now am found, was blind, but now I see. Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fear. Amen. It's, it's hard to wrap your mind around it. Peter said that a day for God is like a thousand years for us. And if you think about that, that our Savior left this physical earth and ascended back to heaven two days ago. The week's not even over yet, and God is in control. He's doing amazing things. Well, it's good to be with you today as we uh, continue in our lectionary readings and studies. Uh, you know, we took a, a break last week as we celebrated Sanctity of Human Life Sunday. But if you remember back a couple weeks ago in the Gospel of Mark, in the very beginning of the Gospel, uh, John the Baptist is preparing the way to repent. The kingdom of God is near. Well, our Savior is in the world, and our Savior has promised to return again one day, and so we, we thank God for his grace, his love, and all that he provides for us. Let us pray. Father God, I pray your blessing today upon my words, that you would help us to understand more fully the words that you would have us uh, to understand through your holy word and through my meager attempt to, uh, to share what you have laid upon my heart today. And so, Father, bless the message that we might not only hear, but that we can take from this and grow and learn and be all that we can be in Christ who continually guides us through your Holy Spirit. For this we pray. Amen. Well, as we, we look at the, the, the realization that John prepared the way for the coming Messiah who had, they had been looking for the Messiah for centuries. And here he was in, in that day that John was able to baptize our Savior and so one of our lectionary readings today kind of picks up a little bit beyond that, and that's from uh, the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, verses 14 through 20. And uh, we read that after John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said, the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. And as Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. And when he had gone a little further, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat preparing their nets. And without delay, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men, and they followed him. So our, our Savior is in the world, and the message is the kingdom of God is near, that we're to repent. 
but I'm amazed at the faith of the first disciples. They dropped what they were doing, and they heard the call of the master, and they followed. And, and I really think that today in the world that we're living in, with all of the sin that seems to be so pervasive in our culture, that we need to be more attuned to our Savior's voice when he's calling us, that we can put aside the things that hinder and the sin that entangles, and we can begin to, to faithfully seek and serve our Savior. Another lectionary reading today is from uh, the Apostle Paul to the church in Corinth at 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 29 to 31. And he says, What I mean, brothers and sisters, is that the time is short. From now on, those who have wives should live as if they don't. And by the way, don't read too much into this, friends. Those who mourn as if they did not. And those who are happy as if they were not. Those who buy something as if it's not theirs to keep. And those who use the things of the world as if it's not engrossed in them. For this world in its present form is passing away. And now Paul's not saying that don't pay attention to your spouse. But pay attention to what's happening in the world around us. That our Savior is in the world and this current world is passing away. It's where do we put our priorities? Where is our focus every day? For every day, we're a day closer to our, our Lord's return. He has been in the world. He has ascended to heaven. He sits at the right hand of the throne of God, and he intercedes on our behalf, and he will return one day. So this message that we have today from uh, the book of Jonah is very important. I think we can take away a lot of things from this. I think if you ask most people what they know about Jonah, they're going to say something about a whale, uh, that Jonah was swallowed by a whale, even though the, the actual wording is a great fish and not the word whale. But that seems to be the takeaway for so many people. And that's, that is just a footnote in the 48 verses of what God is doing through Jonah and through the people of Nineveh and what God desires to do through us today. And, and so we need to understand there's a, a greater context. And certainly that was a miraculous thing that God did. He supplied that, that fish for Jonah, the great fish. And so you need to, to really go to the beginning of the story, some of the backstory to, to understand Jonah 3 that we're going to look at today. Uh, Jonah is called to go to the people of Nineveh who are the Assyrian people, who are the enemies of God's people. And he doesn't want to do it. <laughs> I don't want to go to our enemies. And the Assyrians were, were, were evil, terrible people. They, they uh, filleted people alive. They even practiced cannibalism. They did terrible, terrible things. And so I, I kind of get it. The, the Jonah's having a hard time with this. But when God tells you to go, you should go. Jonah does the exact opposite. He goes the furthest way he can away from where God wants him to go. He wants him to go to Nineveh. Well, he doesn't. He goes down to Joppa and he hops on a boat so that he can travel, right? And he can get away to Tarshish, far away from where God's calling him, as if he could hide from God, as if he could get away from God. And he's down in the hold of this ship and he's sleeping like a baby. And the waves begin to crash and the wind begins blowing and this little ship is in peril, and the crew members who worship other gods are, are praying feverishly to their other gods, and they're fearing for their lives. Captain goes down, and he wakes Jonah up, and he says, hey, pray to your God. Maybe your God can help us. And they begin to ask some probing questions to Jonah. Where are you from? Who do you serve? What, what are you doing? He already told him he was running from the Lord. And he says, throw me overboard, and that will appease the waves. God will quiet the waters. And they began to pray, Lord, forgive us. We do not want any harm to this man, but we don't want to die. So toss him overboard, and the water's flat again. And they began to praise the God who created the heavens and the earth and the seas. You know, as I said, most people remember Jonah and the whale, and, and Jesus spoke of a literal Jonah. 
And he gives us this illustration of being in the grave for three days and risen by God the Father again to new life. And we know that there's meaning in the words and the days that are there. And, and we know as the story begins that the, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai. He says, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come before me. And as we, we get into chapter 3, I want you to note the similarity between the beginning verses in chapter 1 and our lectionary reading in chapter 3 today. They're very similar. Jonah did not want to go to Nineveh. And I learned a long time ago that you can't outrun God. You can't hide from God. You know, God, his will and his plan will be worked out. So Jonah is cast into the water. This huge fish, this great fish scoops him up. And I can't even begin to imagine what that must have been like, but it preserves him for these three days. And during that time, Jonah begins to pray from inside the fish. He prayed to the Lord as God. He said, in my distress, I called to the Lord, and he answered me. Boy, when God has your attention, there are a lot of people call out in, in distress, don't they? when we're going through the calamities and the challenges and the heartaches and the difficulties of life. Oftentimes, people don't know what else to do, and in desperation, they call out to God. And God heard Jonah's prayer. Our God is a God of second chances and, and really a God of third and fourth and fifth and sixth chances. When Jesus was asked about how many times we should forgive, ultimately it was over and over again. No limit to forgiveness. And so God spoke to the fish and it vomited up Jonah onto dry land. And Jonah was now willing to do what he wasn't willing to do previously. So that's where our story begins in uh, our lectionary reading of, of Jonah 3, 1 through 5. I'm actually going to do all 10 verses of chapter 3 today. 10 verses. It's not going to take us that long. Uh, realistically, you can sit down with the book of Jonah, 48 verses you can handle in no time at all. You can read it several times over. And I think you do as you read it more and more, you begin to see how God is working through the challenges and difficulties that we face. Even when we're not willing, God is working behind the scenes and he is working out his plan. And so I think it's good that we hold on to that. Because so often we don't know what to do or where to turn or, or where to look or what to go or where to go or anything. And yet I know God is working it out. You know, there are times I just feel so bad for people that I wish I could make it better. You know, magic wand and just you're, 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 you're good. And yet I know that there is blessing sometimes in the pain and suffering. That there is a, an opportunity to draw closer to God as he works out his plan and I, I'm sure that one day when we get into eternity and we see that God has been working and, and providing and doing things in ways that we couldn't understand on this side of eternity. So let's look at this. This is Jonah chapter 3. It says, the, Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message that I give you. Now this is God's message to the people of Nineveh. All Jonah has to do is show up and share it. He didn't have to come up with fancy ways to entertain the people. He just needed to tell them what God was speaking to him. And the message was simple. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and he went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. And Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming 40 more days, and Nineveh will be overthrown. That's the message. 40 more days, and Nineveh will be overthrown. <laughs> and you know what? The Ninevites believed God. And I'm sure that that was just something that was totally amazing to Jonah. They, they heard this simplistic message, and they believed. As I thought about Moton, and Shillington, and the Governor Mifflin community. I wonder if a message like that was delivered today. Would people believe? See, it might not be 40 days, but it is the message. Our Savior is going to return one day, and all the enemies of God will be put under his feet. 
And there are many people that are outside of the will of God today. And they're not living lives as they should. Their lives are far, far from God. You know, we're not Nineveh, but you know what? I think we could give them a run for their money. We live in a wicked, sinful, fallen world. It's a dark world. And, you know, as they believed God, a fast was proclaimed, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, they put on sackcloth. I don't know a lot about sackcloth. I know a little bit about burlap, and I wouldn't want to wear it. Probably itchy, you know, uncomfortable. And it's a sign of mourning. It's a sign of repentance, and then covering themselves with ashes. You know, they want to die to their sin, and they, they want to be faithful. So they don't want to be destroyed. So picking up on verse 6. When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, he took off his royal robes, he covered himself with sackcloth, and he sat down in the dust. And this is the proclamation he issued in Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles. Do not let people or animals, herds or flocks taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink. But let the people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that they will not perish. Given that a little bit of thought, I wonder what that would be like with the highest ranking officials in our world today hearing the message and surrendering and, and, and praying that God would once again bless us. That we could get out from under the sin that has hindered so many. That we could mourn our sin. That we could have a time of mourning and a time of fasting and a time of fervent prayer asking God to heal us. Heal us as a people. We are a broken, sinful people. God, please have compassion on us. Turn your anger away from us that we will not perish. I think that's a, a vital prayer that's needed today. I can remember as a child at the Billy Graham crusade, being with thousands of people receiving Jesus as Savior and Lord, and just being in awe. God working through Billy Graham with a, a basic message. Repent. Turn from your sin. Turn to Jesus. Receive him as your Savior and Lord. I pray that revival will happen in this country. We don't have a Democrat and a Republican problem. We have a sin problem. We have a sin that is so pervasive in this country that uh, Satan is having a field day pitting people against one another because our focus is not where it needs to be. God, help us. Verse 10, when God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and he did not bring on them the destruction that he had threatened. God can change his mind if people can change their hearts. If people can change their focus, if they can change their direction. You know, it's, it's amazing, this story. And, and I get it. This must have been very difficult for Jonah because the Assyrians were, were evil, terrible people and did a lot of harm to the Jewish people. But here's the thing that puts it in perspective and just a little overview of chapter 4. In chapter 4, we read, but Jonah was greatly displeased and he became angry. You know, he's sitting on the hill overlooking Nineveh and he's waiting, waiting for the foot of God to drop. And he prayed to the Lord, oh Lord, is this not what I said when I was still at home? That's why I was so quick to flee to Tarshish. He has an excuse for not uh, believing God's call in his life. He says, I knew, I knew that you're a gracious and compassionate God, that you're slow to anger and you're abounding in love and a God who relents from sending calamity. Jonah's angry. He's angry that this 120,000 plus people, men and women, children and livestock 
have been spared in Nineveh. Here's the thing. So Jonah, while he's sitting there pouting and being angry, God allows this vine to crop up. The, you know, is probably June, May, June, somewhere in that area. The weather is hot. And this vine, the leaves open up and begin to shade him from the sun. And he's grateful for this vine. So the next day, God provides a worm to bite through the, the bottom of the vine, and it dies. And then he throws an east wind on Jonah, which begins to scorch him, and he feels faint, and he wants to die. And he's angry that God took away his vine. He was more concerned about the vine than the 120,000-plus people in Nineveh. And it got me thinking, I wonder, I wonder if there are times that we're more concerned about our own comfort than about the lives out beyond our doors or even within our, our doors and our families in some cases. And there's a real desperate need for people to know Jesus as Savior and Lord. I've often said that I, I think we are a country of excess. We have too much stuff. You know, when I look at Christians in China and third world countries that have very little of material goods, but boy, do they have a lot of God. And they've got a lot of faith. And people are coming to the Lord in, in droves. You know, I spoke of the Billy Graham Crusades where thousands of people were receiving Jesus in one day. Oh, it would do my heart good to see that happen in this country again. Pure, good, wonderful revival come out. You know, the people of Nineveh, they enjoyed 150 years of the grace of God, and then they were destroyed. They were destroyed because of their wickedness. I'm not sure, but somewhere along the line, they, they began to turn from the God that had rescued them and delivered them and, and had mercy on them. And I look at our country, and I think, Lord, we're modern-day Nineveh. We've turned away from you in droves. People that once were faithful no longer want anything, if anything, to do with God or the things of God or the, the people of God. So I don't want you to miss the main thing about Jonah. Yeah, the, 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 the whale or the great fish, it's pretty spectacular. It was God's vehicle to deliver Jonah to get back on course. But see, there's a greater message. Perhaps there's someone you know, or perhaps you need a second chance, or maybe a third or a fourth chance. Maybe you really need to get back to the basics with God. Maybe you're far away. Jonah was used by God to bring about revival. See, we have a great God, and he showed a great love. Amazing love. When I think about the grace that I've received, that my Savior was willing to lay down his life for me. Because before we were, God knew us and loved us. And he made a way for us to be with him. See, one person who hears the voice of God and shares this good news can make a difference. I really like the other lectionary reading of the initial disciples because they were willing. They heard, and they responded, and they went. They didn't have to be dragged along kicking and screaming. I really think that we need people today to share the message. You know, the last thing in the world I wanted to do is what I'm doing. <laughs> but it was the only thing that I could ever do that would bring me true contentment because I would not find peace until I surrendered and did what God wanted me to do. But you don't have to be a, a preacher or a teacher. The bottom line is you have to be willing to share the good news, and it's good news. You know, so many so many churches today are shying away from preaching the word of God. Jonah's message was simple, but it was God's word. 
And God blessed it and used it and, and he healed thousands. He's healing thousands today. But I really think that we live in a world today that we need to get out and share our faith. We need to, to share the word of God with those that God places in our, our pathway. You know, we need to, to preach the gospel to reach the culture that we live in. And we do that through evangelical preaching and biblical teaching. It's the word of God. You know, I don't need smoke and mirrors. I don't need clever ways. I have everything I need. I need to show up and I need to open up the word of God and share it. It's not mine to give the increase, it's his. So we have God's word to share. Are we sharing it? Are we more concerned about our personal comfort? Are we afraid of rejection? You know, as a pastor, I've been rejected a time or two. I've had people say things that hurt my feelings. I even had one person that threatened bodily harm. You know, the truth of the matter is, is this is the word of God. If you have a problem with it, I'm just the messenger. It's his word. Talk to him. You can't erase it. You can't erase the word of God any more than Jonah thought he could hide from God in the, the, the belly of that ship. Or from the belly of that great fish. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 11.23 proclaims, For I pass on to you what I receive from the Lord himself. God's word. For you. I received it. You can receive it. Paul tells us in Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of this good news about Christ. It is the power of God at work, saving everyone who believes, the Jew first, and also the Gentile. You know, I, I look at the great prophets, and certainly Jonah is a minor prophet, not, not in the sense that that he's not important. It just means that there's very little is written. 48 verses is all there is to Jonah. Unless you know your minor prophets, you have to look at your index in your Bible to, to kind of find this one page, one and a half page that, that Jonah's on. But important, used by God. God wants to use us today. And as I, 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 I pray for, for us as a church, I'm always praying, God, help us to get beyond our walls to help us to find tangible ways to share the good news with people that need good news. So many churches are trying to hide the good news. They don't want to preach the word of God for fear of offending somebody. I don't want to offend God. You know, as you go out into the world this week, pray, pray and ask God how you can Share your faith in tangible ways. You know, it's your story. You, you know how God has touched your life. You can share that with others. And if they reject it, they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting God. But you know what? I believe that seeds are planted along the way. And typically, by the time somebody comes to a saving knowledge of Jesus as their Lord and Savior, they've had many touches on their lives that God's allowed, and he speaks their hearts and then they receive. And I do pray for the world that we live in. I pray for this country. My heart breaks that we are at odds with one another and still bickering over things that, you know what, in eternity aren't going to matter. What really matters now is that there are people, men and women, boys and girls, that don't know Jesus as their Savior and Lord. This is why we open our doors and our hearts and our mouths to share the good news we're not a social club, although we used to do social things before the pandemic. I look forward to when we can do them again, our social dinners and things. You know, I like that connection. But that's not our primary focus. Our primary focus is to fulfill the great commission and the great commandment. We are to share the good news, make disciples, and teach people to obey all that God has received. We're to love God with everything within us, and we're to love others. 
You know, Jonah didn't really care for the Assyrians that lived in Nineveh. Perhaps there's people that you might not care about, but I'm pretty sure that God cares about them. Maybe we need to begin to pray for our enemies and love them and share with them what God's done in our lives. I think revival can happen one person at a time. And I think if the world ever needs to hear the message of good news, it's now. Amen. Let us pray. Father God, we uh, thank you and praise you for this amazing grace that is ours in Christ. He has come into the world and will return again one day. May he find us faithful in all that we say and do. Revive us in our inner being. Bring healing to body, mind, and spirit. Equip us to do your will in the world, in a world that is desperately lost in sin, in desperate need of your good news. Help us to be dispensers of that grace and love. For these things we ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Our closing hymn today is God of Grace and God of Glory. Please stand and join me. God of grace and God of glory, on thy people pour thy power. Crown thine ancient church's story, bring her back to glorious flower. Grant us wisdom, grant us courage for the facing of this hour, for the facing of this hour. Lo, the hosts of evil round us scorn thy Christ and sail his ways from the fears that long have bound us, free our hearts to faith and praise. Grant us wisdom, grant us courage for the living of these days, for the living of these days. Cure thy children's warring madness, and our pride to thy control. Shame our want and selfish gladness, rich in things and poor in soul. Grant us wisdom, grant us courage, lest we miss thy kingdom's goal. Lest we miss thy kingdom's goal. Set our feet on lofty places, gird our lives that they may be. Armored with all Christ's high graces, in the fight to set men free. Grant us wisdom, grant us courage, that we fail not men nor We have a brand new week, new opportunities to share Jesus with those we come in contact with, to pray for our loved ones, our friends, our, our work associates, our neighbors, those that we know in the community, to pray that God's healing touch would be upon them. Fervently pray that God would bring healing to a land that's truly hurting, to a people that are broken and that he would give wisdom and guidance to our leaders, that they might come together in harmony for the good of this country. You know, we can do a lot. If, if Jonah, the reluctant prophet, could have such amazing results because God's blessing is in it, he's still blessing his word today, and he's still using people to share the good news. And so make a difference this week, friends. To him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. 
To the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages and now forevermore. Amen and amen.